It's great to be together this morning. Let's continue in prayer. God, we do thank you for the gift of worship that we gather together to do to bless you and yet blesses us so much. Thank you that we get to come together and listen to your word. We pray that you help us to hear, to listen well. May your word make its way down into our hearts and our minds and change us. Enable us by your spirit to live out your good purpose in our lives. We pray with thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we continue our sermon series called Unsung Heroes, looking at some of those unsung heroes from the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, who, you know, don't always get the limelight. They're not always the ones that are sung about in the songs. And yet, without them, the songs wouldn't be sung. The story would not have happened. They were critical to the bigger story, even though maybe for many uh, people later on, they don't even notice them. Uh, What happened wouldn't have happened without them. It makes me think of Frodo. Do you remember the story, uh, Tolkien's stories, the Lord of the Rings? And in it, You've got, toward the end, you've got Frodo, this hobbit, who's got this incredible ring. It's so powerful, and he liked that at first, but he discovered as time went on that it was actually uh, destroying him and going to destroy the the good in our world. And so he has to take it to Mount Doom to, to drop it into the fiery furnace there, the fire in the middle of the mountain, so it can be destroyed. But the closer he gets to the top of that mountain, the heavier the ring gets. It's magic. It's powerful. And so he is stumbling his way up the mountain, and he's almost to the top, and he just collapses. And he says to his partner, whose name is Sam Wise, another hobbit, who's accompanied him on this whole long adventure, he says, I can go no further. I can't go on. And Sam Wise says, well, I can't carry the ring. It's not his job. It's not his role in the story. But I can carry you. And he picks up. He's exhausted too, but he picks up Frodo and throws him over his shoulder and stumbles his way up the mountain. The story is about Frodo. He's the one who, you know, is going to bring the ring up there. But without Sam Wise, he wouldn't have made it. Our lives are full of stories like that. People who played that kind of a role, you wouldn't be where you are today without them. And that's the case throughout the scriptures. And today we're going to be looking at Jonathan. He's King Saul's son. He's the next in line to become king of Israel. And he's a critical person in the life of David, who actually becomes the next king, who actually is the one to unite all of Israel, the 12 tribes as one. Without Jonathan, David might not have made it. But Jonathan plays this critical role, even though it's a bit unsung. So uh, this story that we're going to look at, it's uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. It's when Jonathan and David first meet. It kind of sets the stage for the rest of the story for them. It takes place right after uh, David has killed Goliath, that Philistine giant who has been intimidating the Israelites for a long time. And David, as you might remember, comes in and says, you know, what are you doing? If the Lord's with us, we can take Goliath. And he goes out and kills Goliath. And then he brings the head of Goliath to King Saul. And today's story picks up right there Uh, As David brings the head, he and Saul speak together. And then we read, after David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David. Because he he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and and gave it to David, along with his tunic, his armor, and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
What an amazing commitment Jonathan makes here, this bond between the two of them. The story goes on from here. David just keeps going from one success to the next. Saul wants him dead, so he says, I'll let you marry my daughter if you go out and kill these Philistines. He goes out and kills the Philistines, although Saul thought he would get killed himself. He sends him out again, and he says, well, kill these 100, and I'll give you this daughter. And he thinks David's going to get killed, but David goes out and kills 100 Philistines. You know, it, he just keeps rising up, and so Saul starts to get very jealous and angry with David. And when David's afraid that Saul is going to kill him, Jonathan steps out, goes to his father and intercedes for him. He advocates for David and says, look, he's done nothing wrong. He's only served you in our nation. You shouldn't kill him. And so Saul relents. A couple chapters later, it's clear that Saul is going to try to kill David. And so then Saul prote or David, Jonathan protects David. He gets a long story in chapter 20 of 1 Samuel, but at the end of it, when he's warned David to run, they embrace and kiss each other, and they're crying, and the scripture says that David wept the more. So David has advocated and interceded, or Jonathan has advocated and interceded for David. He's protected David. And a little later, while David's running off through the wilderness, at the risk of his own life, his dad ends up throwing a spear at him. He's so angry with Jonathan. He protects David. He encourages David. Jonathan lives out his story to support David living out his story. He loves David as himself. Where have you heard that line before? Loved as himself. Sound like anything Jesus might have said? In Leviticus, we read, it's one of the many laws in the book of Leviticus, love your neighbor, anybody know? As yourself. Love your neighbor. What did it say? And then Jesus, when he's asked, what are the, what's the greatest commandment? He says, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor, what? As yourself. That's a tall order. Really, Jesus? We're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves? How do we do that? What is, who's our neighbor, we might ask? Somebody did ask Jesus. He says, well, let me tell you a story. He talks about this Samaritan who is theologically, politically, ethnically a loser as far as the Israelites felt. They're enemies. But a priest and a Levite, good, upstanding Jewish people, come along the road and they see this, this man who's been robbed and beaten laying by the side of the road and they walk by on the other side. But who is it that comes up to him? It's the Samaritan, this person who's got all the wrong politics, all the wrong theology. He's just got it all wrong and yet he gets it right with the greatest commandments. He loves his neighbor as himself. So who is it in that story that is a neighbor. Who is it that's fulfilling the greatest commands? A Samaritan. We can learn a lot by looking at the Samaritan and following his example. We can love like a Samaritan. And in today's story, we can love like Jonathan and we can learn, we can practice what it means for us to be the kind of neighbor, the kind of person the kind of follower of Jesus that God has created us and is calling us to be. How powerful for us to look to Jonathan's example. God calls us to a, a love we see in Jonathan that is God-centered. It starts right there. We, we can't really love our neighbor if we're insecure ourselves. If we're afraid that, you know, we've got to look out for ourselves, we've got to protect, we've got to... We get, no, if we're secure in God, if we start our day secure in God, centered in God, huh, then we can step out 
to love. When we know that we are loved, only then can we love others. When we know who God is, when we know that God is faithful, that God is with us, that we can trust God come what may, then we need not fear. We can be strong and courageous to love our neighbor. We can step out confident in God. We know who God is. The story is his. So whether it's through our life or through even our death, through our success or through our diminishment, as we have happened for Jonathan, the story is God, so we're secure. We're centered in God. We know that we're created in the image of God we're specially made, every single one of us. We're loved by God. We're called by God. Each one of us has a part in the story that God is weaving. It may be different than David's or the person across the room. It will be different. But you are created in the image of God. You are loved by God. You are called by God to live out God's purpose, your part in the story, just like Jonathan did. When we are God-centered, then we know who we are, and we know who our neighbor is. No matter who it is you're looking at, that person is created in the image of God. Whether you like them or not, they're created in the image of God. Whether you're angry with them or not, God loves that person. Whether you think that person is capable of anything at all, that person is called by God to live out a part of the story God is weaving in our world. So that's why we're called to love our neighbor. They're created in the image of God. They're loved by God. They're called to be a part of the story of God. So we ought to be encouraging them toward that, hoping that for them. Centered in God, we know even who our enemy is, that even though the world says and we say they're on the wrong path, they're accomplishing evil in our world, the truth about that person, the most fundamental truth about that person is that they're created in the image of God that they were loved by God and that they're called by God. God's still calling, still wooing, still hoping that they'll turn to God. That's what repentance means. It means turning toward God's way. And we long for that for our enemies, for those we don't like, for those we're angry with. And we understand that that's what sin means. It means when we're off track with God's call in our lives. And we know that actually they're not the only ones who gets off track, who is off track. We are too. You see, we have a lot in common with our enemies. Created in the image of God, loved by God, called by God, and a sinner falling short of the glory of God. And so centered in God, it kind of gives us perspective on ourselves, on our neighbor, on our world. Second thing we see in Jonathan is this kind of love God is calling us to when he calls us to love our neighbor as ourselves is that it's a compassionate love where he calls us to be compassionate, which means to come alongside. That word come on the first end of that is to come alongside, to get walking with this other person, to feel, try to feel what it might be like to be walking in their shoes, to have the experience that they've had. There's a reason that they're acting the way they're acting. Their experience has led them. Their, whatever it is, if we can try to understand that, we will have more compassion, more sympathy for them, and we will find ourselves moved to want to help them, to care for them. Compassion, Jesus says, is uh, one of the characteristics of God. It's one of the words that he mentions the most in the Gospels, that we are to be merciful as our Father is merciful. That kindness, that compassionate, that loving kindness begins with being compassionate with ourselves once again until we're secure in God. We know God loves us and we're allowing God to love us. We've got very little to offer anybody else. You're going to encourage somebody else to be healthy when you're not being healthy? 
You're going to encourage somebody else to follow God's call, to get the rest they need, the food they need, the prayer time that they need, and you're not practicing those things yourself. Be compassionate with yourself. Remind yourself God loves you. And practice being compassionate toward others. We, we can nurture this in ourselves. There are things we can do to help ourselves become more compassionate. It is a thing that God calls us to be. It, the word you might have heard before, it's called prayer. Prayer itself is one of the key ways for us to nurture a compassionate spirit within ourselves. When we pray for ourselves, we're being compassionate to ourselves. We're practicing compassion. God, help me. I feel this. I'm struggling with this. I need your help. You're being compassionate with yourself. That's a good thing to pray for yourself. And it's a good thing to pray for others, to pray God's blessing on your family members, your friends, that they would know God loves them, that they would know God is calling them, has a purpose for their lives, wants them to be a part of the flow, flow of God's blessing in this world. We long for that for our family members and our friends. And as we pray for our enemies, we realize we long for that for our enemies too. Like that would be the best answer of all for the people we disagree with, we struggle with is that all of us would repent and turn toward God, but that we would learn to walk together, to encourage each other forward on the path of God's call, to live as people created in God's image. And God, by the way, is a God of love, right? So in the image of God, we would love. That we would pray for our enemies. It encourages us to be compassionate. What a wonderful way to start our day, even praying, God, help me to be compassionate. Today, help me not to have a judgmental spirit, a bitter spirit, an angry spirit be what I am exhibiting in this world. Help me, Lord, to be compassionate to my friends, my family members, my neighbors, even those I don't even like. May I radiate out your loving kindness, God. Even when I'm disagreeing, may I not be disagreeable. May I... God, be compassionate. And you know what? When we set our sights, it's like an athlete, right? They tell you, if an, as an athlete, envision yourself doing that dive or doing that move or whatever it might be. If you can envision yourself doing it, then when you go out there, you're more likely to do it. When we pray, we envision with God being compassionate, not something else. And when we go out, we're more likely, every day we pray, every day we practice, we're going to get stronger and better at being compassionate. We pray to be compassionate. We pray for our enemies. We pray and we become more and more like Jesus, like Jonathan. God calls us to a love that's centered in God, compassionate, and courageous. Like it takes courage courage to love, to make ourselves vulnerable. You can't love without being vulnerable toward another person. To realize that your kindness, your act of goodness is, may or may not be reciprocated, and yet you step out to do that. Jonathan is courageous here. He takes off his royal robe. He gives it to David, he gives him his armor. He gives him his sword, his belt, and his bow. That's courageous. We know David or Jonathan's courageous. He's shown it earlier in the book of 1 Samuel. And here, he's courageous in loving David as himself. It makes me think of Frodo and Sam Wise on their way up that mountain with that heavy, that ring that just gets heavier and heavier. It's getting harder and harder for Frodo to live that out. Sam Wise says, I can't carry the ring for you. That's your role, but I can carry you. And he picks him up and carries him. You know, that's part of our job. It's to help one another courageously to live it out. I think of, well, I'll keep going. Well, oh, okay. Samson's mother, we talked about her a couple weeks ago. If you remember, she and her husband wanted to know what to do, what this boy was going to do. And the angel said to her, he never answered that. He said, here's what I want you to do. 
Like you live out your call. Jonathan, live out your call. And I'll help David in other ways too. But you live out your call. Sam Wise, live out your call. And whatever your name is, live out your call. Loving your neighbor. But not, you can't live their life for them. You can't force your child or your friend to do what they need to do. You do your part. Encourage them as best you can. But make sure you're doing yours, your part. Love, the love that God is calling us to is centered in God, compassionate, courageous, and finally, it's costly. Like if you don't get this out of the story, you're missing everything. It costs, it costs us to love other people. We've, oh, Jonathan here, taking off this royal robe, in itself, I'm sure it was expensive, but it also symbolizes his place as the heir to the throne. He hands that. He steps out of that privileged position. And you think about Jonathan, what did he do to deserve to be the heir? He was born to Saul. Like, that's what gave him that position of the world. You think about where we are in life. So many of the blessings we enjoy, some of them come because we worked hard. But I didn't choose my parents. I didn't choose to be born in the United States. I didn't, like, I've been blessed in so many ways. And the scriptures tell us, to whom much is given, much is expected. And for Jonathan, that means letting go of his privileged place here to allow David to step up, to grow into who God's calling him to be. And for us, there's no way that we can make this world a kinder, more just place, this nation a more kind and just and peaceful place if we're not willing to sacrifice some of our privileged positions, our possessions even, if we're not willing to be vulnerable and allow those around us to find their opportunities to be encouraged forward in their lives. It's costly, it's dangerous to love your neighbor. It's actually something we cannot do. We don't have the strength to do it. But we can do all things through, through him who strengthens us. We can grow to love our neighbor more and more, better and better. We can do this by God's grace and with one another's encouragement. You know, we want peace on earth. We want people to be happy. And it can happen as each one of us does our part to encourage others we want our church to be vibrant and full of life here. And it's going to happen as each one of us does our part and encourages one another. It's going to cost us time. It's going to cost us investment of our talents. It's going to cost us even financially. But as we do it, God's story grows. The blessing overflows. We want to have friends we want to have good friends, but to have friends, to have good friends, it takes cost on our part. We've got to invest in friendships. We've got to take time to make friends, to be with friends. It tells us, studies, research tells us that it takes hours of investment of time to actually move from being just an acquaintance to a casual friend, and more time, 50 hours to go from casual friend to a, a good friend, and to get to be best friends, another 100, like it takes time, it takes investment. If you want to have friends, you got to go out of your way. you got to give time and energy to it. If we want our nation and we want our world to become more humane, more kind, more just, more peaceful, more good for all people, then it's going to cost us. We've got to be willing to give up our judgmental spirit and nurture a compassionate spirit among us. We've got to give up our entitled, self-centered spirit and nurture a courageous spirit willing to be vulnerable. It's going to cost us our comfort focused, our pursuit of our own happiness spirit. As we nurture a spirit that is willing to love our neighbor, to truly love our neighbor, as ourselves. 
In Luke chapter 10, in the portion that leads right up to the telling of the story of the Good Samaritan, a lawyer has asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know, to have this abundant life that God offers us. And Jesus says, well, tell me what's written in the law. And that lawyer answers so well. He says, to love your, the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says to him, you've answered well. Do this, and you will live. This is the way to that fullness of life. Loving God. Loving, truly loving our neighbor. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for those in our lives who have had the courage to love us, who have been willing to pay the price to sacrifice, to help us, to encourage us, to care for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you show us the way, that you came to walk with us on this earth, that you loved us by giving up your life for us to show us the way to fullness of life, to eternal life. God, help us to live that life beginning right now. Help us to love God like Jonathan. Help us to love Lord Jesus as you have loved us. We pray with thanks in your holy name, Jesus. Amen.